In a world where first impressions mean everything, it's the people who surprise us that we always remember. Mostly a black woman, calm and collected, but handcuffed and wondering what comes next. Who is she? What could she have done? The officers going through their usual routine have no clue who they've just arrested. But then something changes. As they learn her true identity, their faces go pale with shock. How could they not have known? This moment isn't just about an arrest. It's about how much we can get wrong when we judge too quickly. And how sometimes power lies where we least expect it. On a busy afternoon in downtown Atlanta, Dr. Monica Harris, a well-known and respected African-American neurosurgeon, was finally on her way home after a long, exhausting day at the hospital. Monica had spent years working tirelessly to build her reputation in the medical field, and today was no different. She'd just wrapped up a 12-hour surgery. All she could think about was getting home to her family and enjoying a peaceful evening. But before she could do that, she needed to stop by a nearby convenience store to grab a few essentials. Dressed in her casual clothes, Monica pulled into the parking lot and walked into the store, blending in with the neighborhood's usual hustle and bustle. People were going about their day, no one really paying attention to anyone else. But as Monica entered, she noticed the cashier, a young woman named Sarah, giving her a wary glance. Monica shrugged it off, thinking, Maybe I look a little rough after that long shift. Who wouldn't after being on their feet for hours in the OR? As Monica moved through the aisles picking up what she needed, she couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching her. Have you ever felt eyes on you, but when you turn around, no one's there? That's exactly how Monica felt. She tried to ignore it first, but after all, she dealt with subtle prejudices before. Maybe it was nothing. Meanwhile, outside, officers Daniels and Mitchell were parked in a police cruiser, responding to a call about a suspicious person in the area. You see a store employee probably mistaking Monica's exhaustion for something more sinister had called the police. How often do people jump to conclusions like that? It wasn't the first time someone had been misjudged, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. In the store, as she moved towards the cashier, the atmosphere felt tense. Monica was very much aware that Sarah, the cashier, never stopped to gaze at her. Monica sensed the malice as soon as she arrived. She didn't want to stay for a moment longer than necessary. However, as she got closer to the counter, the door opened and two officers named Daniels and Mitchell walked in. They looked around, scanning the aisles like they were searching for someone. Monica's heart skipped a beat. What was going on? What would you do in Monica's shoes? There she was, just trying to buy some milk and bread, and suddenly the police were there. Monica approached the counter to pay for her groceries, feeling a bit uneasy. Sarah, the cashier, seemed on edge, her eyes flicking nervously toward the store entrance. Just as Monica handed over her money, she noticed the two police officers standing nearby, their hands resting on their holsters. Monica's heart skipped a beat. What could this be about? Ma'am, we need to speak with you, Officer Daniel said, his voice firm. Monica turned around, taken aback. Is there a problem, officers? She asked, trying to keep her voice calm. We received a call about a suspicious person matching your description. Officer Mitchell added, his expression serious. Monica's heart sank. Suspicious person? She couldn't believe it. I'm just buying some groceries, she said. I don't understand what this is all about. Please step outside with us, Daniels ordered. Reluctantly, Monica left her items on the counter and followed the officers outside. A few people had started to gather, whispering and pointing towards Monica. Monica felt a rush of embarrassment and confusion. Was this really happening? As she tried to explain that she was just an exhausted doctor trying to pick up some groceries, the officers barely listened. Do you have any identification? Mitchell asked his tone not particularly friendly. Monica nodded and reached into her bag to get her ID. But before she could fully pull it out, Officer Daniels grabbed her arm roughly. Don't move, he barked. Monica flinched at his harsh grip. I'm just getting my ID, she said, trying to keep her voice steady, even though her nerves were fraying. 
The crowd outside was growing, and Monica felt their eyes on her, adding to her mounting stress. How had something so mundane turned into such a big ordeal? The officers Daniels and Mitchell, still not convinced, decided to take things a step further. They put handcuffs onto Monica's wrists, and she felt her heart drop. The cold metal was a stark reminder of how quickly things had changed. As they led her toward the police cruiser, Monica felt a crushing mix of anger, humiliation, and helplessness. How did it come to this? As they walked, Monica tried to stay calm, but inside, she was struggling. She had spent years working hard, earning respect in her field, only to be treated like a criminal based on a mistaken judgment. Is this really happening? She thought people outside were staring some with looks of shock, others whispering among themselves. Monica could hear snippets of their conversations. What's going on and why are they arresting her? The crowd's curiosity made her feel even more exposed and vulnerable. Monica glanced at the officers, her frustration bubbling over. Can someone explain what's going on? She asked, trying to keep her voice calm. The officers didn't respond, their expressions remaining stone-faced. Once they reached the cruiser, Monica was carefully placed inside. She watched as the store employees, including Sarah, looked on with varying degrees of discomfort and guilt. Monica wondered, did they realize the impact of their actions? As they drove to the police station, Monica sat quietly in the back of the cruiser, her mind racing with worry. What would David think when he realized she wasn't home yet? Her husband, who is a lawyer, usually so composed, would be losing his mind by now. And Jessica, her teenage daughter, who always looked up to her as her role model, must be feeling scared and confused. Monica's guilt was overwhelming. Would David, searching for her, and try to figure out where she was? Her mind wandered to their last conversation, where she'd promised Jessica she'd be home in time for dinner. To how could she explain this mess to them? And why had a simple trip to the store turned into such a nightmare? The question spun in her head as the cruiser rolled toward the station, each one adding to the weight of the situation. How would she ever make sense of this when she finally got home? When they arrived at the station, Monica was placed in a holding cell, the cold metal door clanging shut behind her. The room was small and dimly lit. There was a bench along one wall. She sat down, trying to make sense of everything that had happened. After what felt like hours, the door creaked open, and a different officer stepped inside. He was a large man with a stern face, someone she hadn't seen before. Without a word, he approached Monica, his presence looming over her. Stand up, he barked. His tone was harsh. Monica hesitated, confused by the sudden demand. I said stand up, he repeated. He was louder this time. She slowly rose to her feet. Her heart was pounding. The officer grabbed her roughly by the arm, dragged her toward the center of the cell. What's this about? Monica asked, trying to keep her voice steady, but there was no response. Instead, he shoved her against the wall, his hand pressing down on her shoulder. Just checking for any contraband, he sneered. This time, his voice dripped with sarcasm. The way he said it, the look in his eyes. It was clear he didn't believe she was anything more than a criminal. Monica felt a wave of humiliation and fear as the officer patted her down with unnecessary force, his hands lingering too long on her body. This wasn't about safety. It was about power, about putting her in her place. She bit her lip, refusing to let him see her cry, refusing to give him that satisfaction. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the officer stepped back. You're clear, he said, as if she'd ever been a threat. He left the cell, the door slamming shut behind him, leaving Monica shaken. She sat back onto the bench. She was trying to gather her thoughts, trying to push the incident out of her mind. But the reality of what had just happened hung heavily in the air. This is a reminder of the prejudice she faced, even in the most vulnerable of situations. The two officers then turned to a stack of paperwork on their desk, where they began to make notes about the incident.
Monica overheard them discussing how they had initially doubted her identity and considered fabricating additional reasons to hold her longer. We need to make sure this doesn't get out of hand, Mitchell said. What if her story makes us look bad? Daniels agreed. As Monica sat in the holding cell, her frustration grew with every passing minute. She overheard the officers outside discussing the situation. Their conversation showed they were clearly being racist. Daniel scoffed. I don't care who she is, she's still just another black person who thinks they can get away with anything, Mitchell added with a smirk. Yeah, it's like they expect special treatment just because of their skin color. They think they're untouchable. Their remarks made it painfully clear that Monica was being unfairly targeted and dehumanized because of her race. Mitchell then made a disturbing decision. He walked over to the cell and with a smirk threw Monica's phone on the floor in front of her. You don't need this, he said, with a tone that made it clear he believed she was undeserving of basic rights. Monica, already feeling dehumanized, was struck by the officer's blatant disregard for her situation. It was clear that despite Monica's high-profile status and clear credentials, the officer's deep-seated biases prevented them from treating her with the respect and fairness she deserved. Moments later, she watched as the officers outside the cell checked her ID, the weight of the situation sinking in. She could see the officers' expressions change as they read through her credentials. She's a neurosurgeon, Mitchell whispered to Daniels. A highly respected one at that, but the damage had already been done. After her identity was revealed, the situation took a disturbing turn. Daniels and Mitchell were visibly shaken. It seems that they are unable to reconcile their actions with their newfound knowledge. They hesitated and exchanged uneasy glances. They continued to treat Monica with suspicion. We can't just let her go, Mitchell said. His voice was a mixture of disbelief and reluctance. What if this is a trick? The tension escalated when Monica, feeling the need to call her lawyer and inform her family of the situation, requested to use her mobile phone. The officers flatly refused, insisting that she had to remain isolated until further instructions came. Their refusal was not due to any procedural necessity, but seemed rooted in a deeper prejudice. Monica overheard Daniels muttering to Mitchell, she's probably trying to find a way to manipulate us or something. We should keep her in here until we're completely sure. The situation became even more alarming. There was another officer responding to the officer's report, began making derogatory comments about Monica's appearance and background, suggesting that she must be involved in something criminal due to her race and socioeconomic status. Why would someone like her be out in this area at this hour? She's probably got something to hide, the officer said loudly enough for Monica to hear. These remarks further exposed the underlying racism. It demonstrated a disregard for Monica's rights and dignity. They treated her not as a respected professional, but as a suspect based solely on her black color. The officer's actions and comments reinforced the prejudices that were driving their decision-making. As the officers continued to exhibit their biases, Monica's frustration grew. She watched them through the small window of the holding cell. She was feeling increasingly dehumanized. The lack of basic communication facilities made her feel even more powerless. The overtly racist comments and actions only intensified her distress. The situation took a particularly disturbing turn when one of the officers, a tall man, with a harsh demeanor, began mocking Monica's credentials. He walked by the cell and in a loud voice meant for her to hear, said to his colleague, why are we even letting her talk to her lawyer? She's probably used to getting special treatment because of her job. The officer's tone was laced with scorn, as though he couldn't believe a black woman could be a neurosurgeon. The racial bias became even clearer when another officer, who had been standing by, decided to make a point of checking Monica's cell personally. As he did, he leaned in close and sneered, You know, people like you are always trying to play the victim. Let's see how you like being on the other side of the bars for a change. Their harsh behavior was not just a violation of Monica's rights, 
but also a display of the racial prejudices. The officer's comments and refusal to grant her basic rights, like using her mobile phone and calling her lawyer further, demonstrated their unwillingness to treat her with the respect which she deserved, regardless of her status and profession. After some time, Captain Reynolds, a seasoned officer known for his no-nonsense attitude, arrived at the station. He strode in, looking every bit the part of someone who'd seen it all. He took one look at Monica's file and immediately ordered her release. This is a serious mistake, Reynolds said, his voice laced with frustration. Dr. Harris, I deeply apologize for this. You should never have been treated this way. Monica watched the exchange, her heart still racing. Was this really going to be resolved so quickly? As Reynolds spoke, she felt a mix of relief. How had it taken so long for someone to recognize the error? And what about the impact this had on her? As she waited to be officially released, she couldn't help but wonder how often these kinds of mistakes happened, and how many people had been wrongly treated like she had. Monica was finally released from the cell, her wrists still hurting from the handcuffs. She took a deep breath, trying to calm many emotions inside her. As she headed for the exit, she looked back at the officers that misbehaved with her and did not listen to her, her face showing expression of disappointment and anger. I hope you understand the gravity of what you've done, Monica said, her voice steady despite the anger simmering beneath the surface. This isn't just about me. This is about the systemic racism that people of color face every day. She let those words sink in, hoping they'd leave an impact. Captain Reynolds met her gaze and said, You're absolutely right, Dr. Harris. We'll be conducting a thorough investigation into this incident. His tone was earnest, and Monica could see he was genuinely concerned. Monica's encounter with the police began with a simple stop at the store, but escalated into a distressing experience. This incident highlights the racial biases within law enforcement. Despite being a respected neurosurgeon, Monica was mistreated. She faced suspicion. She was wrongfully detained. The officers, Daniels and Mitchell, initially failed to acknowledge their error and continued to display racial bias. Upon returning home, Monica found comfort in her family's support. David, her husband, immediately saw the need to turn their negative experience into a force for change and a movement for black people rights. They discussed their options and agreed on taking legal action. They also discussed raising awareness about racial discrimination. Her husband reached out to local media and Monica's story quickly gained attention. Her story made headlines and drew public attention. Monica agreed to share her experience with raw honesty. Her story highlights the everyday prejudice and racial profiling faced by people of dark color. Her story resonated widely, leading to an outpouring of support from her community colleagues and even strangers who had faced similar situations. This support reinforced Monica's resolve to continue advocating for racial justice. Monica's story is a reminder that even in the face of adversity, one person can create a positive impact and also inspire others to stand up for what's right. Her journey from victim to advocate demonstrates the importance of acknowledging and addressing the prejudices that exist within society and our institutions. If you were in Monica's shoes, how would you use your experience to bring about change? Racial discrimination can be a haunting experience, as it is evident from the story of Monica Harris, who gives strength to everyone to fight for justice. How do you suggest communities and law enforcement can collaborate to prevent such occurrences and fight put up for equality? Have you or someone, you know, been through something like this? How did you handle it? Drop a comment below so we can all start a conversation about how to make a real difference and make sure everyone is treated with the respect they deserve. Your voice matters.